All right, everyone, thank you. Uh, my name is Michael Chodas. I'm the Associate Administrator for Entrepreneurial Development at the SBA. Uh, uh, it is our job to connect all of those resources out in the community, our small business development centers, our women's business centers, SCORE chapters, as well as all of our online and other resources, to connect those throughout the economic development ecosystem with, among many other things, our young entrepreneurs and with our HBCU and MSI networks. So what we're here to talk about in the second panel is all the things that happen after what we just discussed in our first panel. So there is an opportunity for more conversation about entrepreneurship programs throughout the HBCU and MSI network. And then just as important, we need to talk about essentially the question that that young woman asked from Howard, which is, what do I do next? If I'm considering entrepreneurship in school, how do I get support in school? That's what the first panel was talking about. And then what do I do out in the community? How do I get support while I'm going to school to think about entrepreneurship? And what do I do as soon as I launch? Entrepreneurship is about changing the economic picture of our communities. And our communities are about how we connect with each other. To the extent that we're working, doing good work even, but in a stovepiped and not linked way, we're not doing the best job we can. So here, we have panelists to talk about all of the different ways in which their own experiences have involved leveraging and connecting these different resources and all the things that they do and are available to do with each of your institutions as we move forward. So with that, let me introduce my very distinguished second panel here. So uh, first, we have Valerie Mosley over here. How are you? Thank you. Right there in the middle. Valerie is the Senior Vice President, Partner, and Investment Strategist at Wellington Management Company, LLP, a $560 billion global management firm. Uh, she is <coughs> part of the President's Board of Advisors on HBCUs. Right here next to me, we have Deborah Thomas. Deborah is an HBCU alum first. Where did you go, Deborah? It doesn't happen on my show. Alabama State University. Alabama State. And she founded data, in 1994, uh, Deborah founded Data Solutions and Technology, Inc., <coughs> excuse me, which is a full professional services, a full professional services firm in information technology. Uh, you started that firm back in 1994, and you're up to, up to 250 employees, as I recall now, right? Correct. All right. Uh, we have Luis Barunda. Luis is the president and CEO of the U.S. Hispanic Youth Entrepreneurship Education Group. Uh, this is, after all, all about youth entrepreneurship. Uh, we're connecting out into the community and building our communities, but we're starting there in school. So look forward to hearing from Luis as well. Uh, down at the other end, we have Ron Busby, who is president of the U.S. Black Chamber. Uh, he is also a member of SBA's Council for Underserved Communities. Ron is himself an entrepreneur and a small business owner, which went from a very small business uh, USA Super Clean started out about 150,000 annual revenue and he increased it to over 15 million. He has extremely, uh, a, a number of distinctions, honors, etc. He is one of our leading lights in entrepreneurship and how to connect in the chamber community to our institutions. And we have Terry Clark, who is the VP for Entrepreneurship and Business Development from the National Urban League. And Terry actually began his career with the SBA, so he's a member of the family, working as the assistant district director, <coughs> excuse me, for management assistance throughout the 14 counties, southern part of New York. So with that, I want to let our panelists start to begin the conversation with you. And I think what we should do is we should talk about these connections, first and foremost, and personal experiences and what that actually looked like. Because a number of our panelists actually started themselves. So, Ms. Thomas, why, can't we, why don't we start with you? Okay. And can you please just let us know about what it was like uh, starting out your own business and what services were there to support you when you were beginning? Okay. Thank you, Michael. Good afternoon. And thank you so much for coming out today. And I certainly say thank you to Ms. Marie Johns for inviting me today. I am HBCU. I am very proud. I am a graduate of Alabama State University. So, and further along the conversation, in 1994, I decided to go into business. I decided, I made the choice to take the chance for change. And in coming to this particular area in 1988, I got introduced to small business because I had always worked for large business and I thought you had to have a million dollars in order to start a business. 
far from the truth. You've just got to have time, energy, and a plan. A great resource that I had in starting my business was the Small Business Administration Office. Uh, the Small Business Administration Office today, though, has so much, and that's all you've got to do is Google it, put it into your cell phone, and all the resources will come popping to you. I see Janetta Hardy out there in the audience. Janetta was one of the counselors that helped get me started. She's a graduate of Howard University. I thought I saw her. She was over there. But anyway, <laughs> going back from the perspective of talking about going into business. I was introduced to small business when I came here in 1988, and therefore in 94, I started Data Solutions and Technology. I say I started out with myself and my husband because he had to continue to work. He was a half of an employee uh, to pay the bills. In starting the plan of what was I going to do, in coming to this area, I got introduced to small business, government contracting. I never have worked for the federal government. So it was a matter of I had to walk and beat on at least a thousand doors before I got my first contract, but I was able to get my first contract. I started in 1994. I was able to get my 8A certification through the SBA in 1996. I graduated in 2005, and we still are growing very, very strong. The bottom line, though, you have to be entrepreneurial. You've got to take the chance to say that you're going to make change for yourself. I can only tell you that in taking this chance, in making that choice, I have changed the lives for many. I have worked in Prince George's County for 17, going on 18 years now. And it really is a very good good feeling. We have been able to develop and grow business from uh, information technology. We are now branching into aviation management, management support services, logistics, scientific and technology. The Department of Energy has been the true champion of DST along with the Department of Commerce so I have to shout out to them because those were my first two agencies and they still are lasting agencies. At this particular time, we're working in more than 12 different agencies with over 100 various contracts that we've had since the inception of Data Solutions and Technology. When you look at me, I say I'm from the fields to Capitol Hill. I'm from the fields of Montgomery, Alabama and I have arrived here in Maryland, truly able to make a difference. And in giving back to my historically black colleges and university, two years ago I started an HBCU conference on entrepreneurship. The reason being, do you know what April 16th is? In 1862, what happened? Emancipation, Emancipation Proclamation is just ironic that we're here today celebrating entrepreneurship what it's all about. In thinking about where we've come from civil rights perspective, the state of Alabama is very seldom recognized, let alone the HBCUs. So in listening to the executive order of 13532, I was there thinking of what can I do for DST, Data Solutions and Technology, which is my company. And as I was speaking and writing, the idea came you should start an entrepreneurship seminar. You should take that conference back to Alabama and energize them so therefore they will get into that entrepreneurial thought process because that's where entrepreneurship started and that's where civil rights started and get it on the map. So we did it in 2011. It was entrepreneurship, globalization of the new south we just completed our second conference, Entrepreneurship, Transforming Education, Government, and Industry. And we're taking it back next year. And it will be Entrepreneurship, Fostering Creativity, Innovation, and Opportunities, March 4th through the 6th, 2013. So if you have the time, the energy, and I definitely plan on uh, contacting all of the entrepreneurial uh, 
deans and uh, our organizations that's doing it because we want to take it so we can spread it and really get the thought process going in our classrooms. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. <laughs> Luis, perhaps you can talk about uh, you uh, uh, foster and build and promote entrepreneurship starting with high school students right. and working through the university system. Yeah. How does that show up and how does that work and what advice do you have for the universities and the institutions here? Our, our, I think our biggest challenge um, when we first, uh, first of all, I am a, a business owner and uh, I was the first Latino to ever sit on the Baltimore County School Board, the 25th largest in the country. And when uh, I asked a very simple question at uh, a school board meeting, uh, or my first school board meeting, it was, uh, what are we doing for the emerging Latino population in Baltimore County? And you could have heard a pin drop. And so um, I began to, to look around at our dropout rates and uh, figured out that uh, the uh, African American population and Latino population have much in common in terms of the uh, challenges that our high school uh, students are having in terms of dropping out. And so I began to, uh, an organization called U.S. Hispanic Youth Entrepreneur Education, which is a, a long name, so we call it UCHI for short. And uh, we began UCHI to um, uh, really focus on that high school to college continuum for Latino youth. And uh, that was begun in 2005. Um, shortly thereafter, I began to uh, look at different ways that uh, our organization might be able to partner with other African-American organizations. And uh, the idea uh, hit me about three years ago that we needed to bring Latino youth and, and uh, African-American youth together, high school students, rising juniors and seniors, to a conference that would help them understand uh, that high school to college continuum, help them uh, uh, with college access, and begin to talk to them about uh, business and entrepreneurship. Um, I, I'm, some, some of you may battle with me on, on this next comment, but I, I really believe that um, entrepreneurship is uh, caught, not taught. And by that I mean that <clears throat> exposure to entrepreneurs, um, uh, like many of you, for example, for these young people, is their first uh, access point uh, to entrepreneurship when a young person can sit across from you and you can share your story uh, of, of uh, how you came from the fields to Capitol Hill. Um, that makes an impact and begins the juices flowing for these young people. And so uh, we have uh, a workshop we titled, uh, we title uh, our, our uh, legends. And uh, at that workshop we bring business people, both Hispanics and African-American um, uh, business professionals as well as entrepreneurs, uh, just to sit in the small groups of oh, five or six students, high school students, and, and they begin a dialogue. And, and uh, one of the uh, end goals there is to um, have a mentor perhaps come into that young, excuse me, that young person's life. And um, so we're uh, we're, we held our first, uh, we call Latino Black Student Leadership Summit at Coppin University, which is an HBCU in the Baltimore area. Uh, last year it was a two day, one night uh, program. This year it's expanded to three days, two nights. So please mark this in your calendars. It's July 12th through 14th. And if you're interested in sitting on uh, our Legends panel, we'd love to have you apply to uh, that um, uh, particular workshop or if you'd like to volunteer in any way that would be awesome as well but we we really believe that uh, uh, entrepreneurship uh, as has been in my case is has been a vehicle that uh, young people need to explore as a career option as was mentioned earlier small business drives the heartbeat of this country and we 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 are on, from my personal perspective uh, what we have between our ears is really that's all, in many ways that's all that's left. Uh, our industrial base is gone and uh, we really need to 
uh, challenge these young people to think creatively. How can they create their own uh, 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 business? How can they create something uh, that sustains them rather than having to depend on corporate America, who in many instances, as was mentioned earlier, it has shipped jobs overseas and has been doing so for uh, uh, decades now. So, Thank you, Luis. Uh, Valerie, can you, uh, g you currently work in corporate America, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but you are also one of the president's advisors on HBCU. So the connection between your work, especially your work in women's leadership, uh, how can you talk to this group about ways in which they can make connections between the spirit of entrepreneurship on campus, your success, and how to create that sort of feeling that there is a direction and a path? Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Thank you, Marie. Appreciate being here. I was impressed by some of the comments that were made by the panel, the earlier panel. And I'm going to share some of the takeaways that I had from that. And at the end of the day, it's relationships. It's all about relationships. And if we think about our interpersonal relationships, our family relationships, our professional relationships, people want to be appreciated and there's some give and there's some take. So what I walk away with and what I would share to the audience, and whether you're a student or whether you're a college administrator, um, that what's going to matter in life and what matters with regards to success and what comes back is the quality of your relationships. So some of the things that Dr. Ovaltree talked about or Dr. Jones and other, um, other panelists, uh, Dr. Malvo, it's about what do you say when you're approaching a corporation and how do you engage them and how does the student engage them? So what I found to be very successful is taking or two things one you want some sort of engagement with a person let's say it's a corporate a sponsor a potential sponsor you want that engagement and two you want to align interests so the first thing you have to do is spend time understanding what is it that they want so I believe it was uh, one of the presidents I think it was uh, Dr. Jones mentioning that they did a survey what would you like to get out of your engagement with the university and sometimes it's money, of course, this is what you want. They'd like to give it, it's easy, they can give the money, they have, a corporate, they have a group of people that will just give money to different causes. Many times, they want their employees to get engaged in something. So at Wellington, for example, we have um, partners and we have junior partners called associates. The first year associates have to select some sort of community involvement and what is that involvement. And more often than not, they want to be engaged. So being able to, and, and they want a connection with the student. So being able to say, can you allow some of our students to judge the project that you're doing, it gives exposure to the students and it gives some engagement with the employees. Um, I think that's very important. The other thing is uh, I found, I, what I do professionally is I manage money and I've been doing it for over 20 years. And a lot of the individuals that come through, the companies have, huge, uh, uh, organ they, they reward their employees for giving. And so you'd be surprised how, how, many, how much resources you can get just by tapping into that resource. And so I don't think that the development offices often go to the groups that are involved with community service as opposed to the treasurer. So there are different points in a corporation that you can tap. The other thing is that as you know, most developers at, 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 uh, at, at colleges will go for those that have the money, naturally. But what I found is that there are a lot of individuals that, whose egos like being stroked by having naming opportunities, of course. But often that's applied to buildings, and I know that you know that. But many times, they like it for programs. So I found many strong entrepreneurs that would be very happy to give money for a program that, would, that allows it to be sustainable. So if it's entrepreneurship, thinking about how they grew up, and often it's not someone that's from the United States. So it might be folks in India or China because they understand, they understand um, the power of a drive. I, in January, I went to China. I was in Hangzhou, uh, China, and I was at this event where they were um, awarding these billionaires, the most successful businessmen. I was really struck, I'm going on a detour right here, I was really struck that three out of the 10 that were 
um, being awarded. And I'm sitting next to somebody who's doing the translation. And this guy is a shipping mogul. He comes up and he whispers to me. He said, he can't read. I said, excuse me? He said, um, he didn't finish the sixth grade. Another one didn't finish the third grade. And he's thanking the government and his wife helps him read. I said, I just thought that was remarkable. Here he is, he's a, he's a real estate shipping mogul. He's never been to formally to college. And there were several people like that. And then the gentleman who was translating talked about his, his uh, own father, who is the largest exporter of down out of China. And he started by buying a small duck farm when, uh, a long, long time ago. And he, too, is not educated. And so uh, what struck, and then at the same time, and this is talk about contrast. So I'm there, and there are all these billionaires. And of course, I'm the only one that looks like myself. I'm the only one there that doesn't speak Chinese. Um, and I get a text from someone that says, uh, can you tell me the number of African-American women whose companies are valued at $100 million? And it just struck me. Like the night before, this is what I'm seeing. And then here, I, we struggled to find five to 10 women in the United States that had value. Now mind you, for a company to be valued at $100 million, if you assume an average of a six multiple for a smaller company, they might need to have $20 million in sales, like, which is negligible. And mind you, that night, later that night, I had um, dinner with a young couple. The guy was 30 with his wife, and he started an online company. So what are you doing these days? He says, oh, I changed, and I just started online. And, and he started in December. This was the end of, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm digressing, but there's a point to it. It was the end of June, I mean January, and he already had, he was up to 10000 a day, $10,000 a day, and he's selling underwear online. And he had an idea. And he went with the idea. So the spirit, it, there's a spirit of, entrepreneur, of can do, of entrepreneurship. And I believe that those guys that wound up doing really well is because they had an opportunity. Then they didn't force, and, they didn't, and as a guy mentioned, now it might be harder to become a billionaire if you didn't have any education, you can't read. But at the time, it was that, that drive. And I feel like if you give people exposure, it is the exposure that empowers the uh, young people and it engages the, the um, the folks with the money. So if you, if you figure that it's all about entrepreneurs, I mean, it's all about relationships, it is who do you tap into? And when you tap into an organization, it's not just the person with the money, it's also the people with, the, um, with time. Because those that have time can influence the money. And so I think sometimes people are short-sighted and just saying, let me fill my endowment. But if they are engaged and have a relationship, the money comes so much more easily. Um, the last thing I'll share is that this is a personal note. So I've been with Wellington for 20 years, and I gave notice that I'm going to withdraw, and I'm going to join the entrepreneurship uh, space. <laughs> <laughs> Effective June. <laughs> and that's a big step. You know, I'm a single mom. I have three kids. There are always risks. You always wonder about the downside. But I think I make decisions uh, uh, because I manage money, I think, in terms of money, like a call option call option has the, the downside is limited, the upside is like a hockey stick. The upside is great. So if you can protect your downside, you've got to go for the upside. So I That's applaud it. you, and I'm going to do it too. <laughs> well, Valerie, I, I uh, encourage you to go to sba.gov and type in your, your zip code, and we'll, we'll connect you up with a uh, counselor and mentor. So uh, we've got you covered. You're not alone. Uh, so Terry? Uh, you're in charge of entrepreneurship at the Urban League. Can you talk about the ways in which the Urban League is supporting and promoting entrepreneurship and opportunities for connecting in with our networks here today? Sure. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you, Marie. Thank you, Michael, for inviting me. I appreciate being here. Uh, our program, the uh, Entrepreneurship Center program, uh, works through our affiliates. Our organization is a 101-year-old organization that uh, it's located in 35 states in the District of Columbia, and an organization that about six years ago, under the leadership of our current president, uh, former mayor of New Orleans, Mark Morial, developed an entrepreneurship program because one of the things that the Urban League was looking to do was to get more involved in economic empowerment. And uh, through that program, what we've been able to do is, um, in the last year, serve about 8,500 business owners, helping them with 
uh, management and technical assistance that's allowed them to be able to develop and grow their businesses. In fact, uh, Dr. Holyfield uh, was one of the affiliates that we work with out of our Cleveland office. Uh, and what we're looking at is this. We feel the people that we deal with primarily, they understand the technical side of their business. What we try to do is teach them the management side of the business, how to be able to put your books together in a proper manner so you don't have the internal revenue service bother you, when to file your taxes, when, how to put together a business plan, what you do with the business plan, not only to get financing, but to actually use it to run and operate your business, uh, things of that nature. So what we look at is providing people with those technical skills that are necessary, whether they're starting a business or they're in business. And as a result of the services that we provided last year, our clients were able to start and save almost 5,000 jobs, along with get about $25 million in financing and uh, new business opportunities. So we're pretty, pretty pleased with what we've been able to do, and we're looking to expand the program. But one of the things that the Urban League has always done, we've always been in the technical assistance arena. So we've provided management assistance, and we do management training. Last year, we decided it was, it was time for us to tackle the issue that really affects most business owners. And that's capital. So what we are now in the process of doing, and hopefully we'll have uh, pushed out this year, is we are in the process of developing a CDFI, which is a Community Development Financial Institution. This loan fund that we are going to develop, when we fully populate it, will be $50 million. And that, the primary purpose of that fund is to lend money to small and minority-owned businesses throughout this country. In the, in the 35 uh, states that we do business in, here across the District of Columbia, and then also in other states where we don't do business, but we have partners that we work with. Uh, what we're hoping is that through the relationships that the Urban League has developed over the course of the years with various commercial banks, uh, certainly with the SBA, that we will be able to populate this fund over the course of, this, of these next six to nine months and that will allow us to be able to turn money out into the street and help people who are looking to start and really grow their businesses have, an, have additional access for capital because we found that that's one of the things that business owners have a lot of difficulty in and especially the business owners that we're dealing with because a lot of our clients are people who come to our, our affiliates. They may need assistance in business, in our business services, but they may also need other services that the Urban League provides helping maybe a family member get a job or increase their educational opportunities or housing opportunities. So we're able to kind of provide what we consider a wraparound service. But now that we move into the service of providing uh, capital, not only starting out with small businesses, but then expanding that to people who are going to be developing affordable housing over the course of time in community facilities, we feel that now we have a deeper stake in what goes on in the communities that we serve. And that's what we're looking to do. And as, as time moves along, hopefully we will be able to take that capital and help some of, the, some of the people in this room and some of the students that you work with in developing and growing and operating their businesses. That's, what, that's our hope and, and our plan. Because our major thing is to help people develop businesses so they can be in a position to hire other people. Our goal is to increase job opportunities. And we've noticed through research that we've done over the course of the last six years since I've been in the program is that small and primarily minority businesses tend to hire minority individuals at a much higher rate than non-minority businesses. So to grow these businesses and to help them develop now helps not only those business owners, but it helps the community at large. That's what we're looking to do. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Uh, Ron, uh, you are yourself an entrepreneur, and you're now the president of the U.S. Black Chamber. Terry was just talking about the sort of holistic approach to the needs of a business in the community. What does the U.S. Black Chamber currently do? How does it bring together those different resources in order to develop the community and small business? Well, thank you, Michael. Um, I want to give some acknowledgments to some individuals as well. Uh, obviously, Marie Johns, who's been uh, a true savior to not only the U.S. Black Chamber, to, but to black businesses as well. Jerry Flavin uh, from the SBA, 
our good friend Donald Cravens. Um, as it was stated, I sit on the Council of Underserved Communities, uh, and there's another one of my members here, uh, Derek, uh, who also sits on that council. Uh, most importantly, I'm a graduate of two HBCUs. Uh, I went to undergrad at Florida A&M, and I went to graduate school at Clark Atlanta University. Before I went there, I, I spent a year as, in my senior year in high school at Stanford University. And I remember my first day going to school. Hold on. My first day there, they said, look to your left, look to your right. One of y'all not going to be here. <laughs> I said that was probably me. And I, I, I made the best decision I've ever made in my life. I transferred to Florida A&M. And I remember distinctively the first day of school, they said, look to your left look to your right, look in front, and look behind. These are the individuals that we want to partner with, we want you to marry, because these are the future leaders of this country. And to this day, I credit most of my success to Dr. Sybil Mobley, the Dean of School of Business and Industry at Florida A&M, who truly changed my life. <clears throat> One of the things that Florida A&M truly stood on was about opportunities. Um, I know that most of you in this room represent HBCUs, but the fact of the matter is more African Americans will graduate next year from an online university than all the HBCUs combined. Mm -hmm. We truly have to take that into consideration on how we educate our kids, how we motivate our children, and how we administer our own universities. Mm -hmm. uh, today is truly about entrepreneurism, and as the president of the U.S. Black Chamber, I'm really excited to be here because it is about entrepreneurism. I get an opportunity to speak to children, high school and students, as well as college students across the country. And I want to say, ladies and gentlemen, this generation is not a lost generation. They truly understand it. We have to be the visionaries for our children because I don't want us to get them off focus. Too often we tell them that entrepreneurism is truly the way of the future. Most of us know that 90% of small businesses fail the first year. No ifs, ands, and buts about it, they're going to fail the first day they start. So why would you take an 18, 19, 20-year-old young African-American who's truly using their mom and dad's credit card, they're going out for this first opportunity, and now they're going to make a mistake on their own dime, where they're not going to be able to make that up in a short period of time. I tell folks, I had the opportunity as my sophomore year at Florida A&M, we had a loan professor there from IBM. He took a liking to me and said, Ron, have you ever thought about working in corporate America? And I said, you know, I want to be an entrepreneur. Uh, the guys that lived in my community of Oakland, California that were making money all worked for themselves. And he said, well, do you know what you want to do? And I said, well, the richest guy in my neighborhood was a dentist, so I want to be a dentist. <laughs> He said, well, I'd like for you to go and work at IBM for a summer uh, to get experience, you know, just working in corporate America. And it was probably the best experience that I had because I thought I wanted to be an accountant until I spent three months in an accounting <laughs> department and realized I didn't want to be an accountant. Um, I had the opportunity to then go back and work in corporate America from IBM, Xerox, was a vice president at Coca-Cola. And while I was at Coca-Cola, I had the opportunity to meet some of the richest entrepreneurs that this country has from our community, which were McDonald's franchisees. Mm -hmm. What folks don't understand with McDonald's, if you're a franchisee, you started flipping burgers. Uh, you started cleaning grills, and you started sweeping and mopping bathrooms. I came out of an entrepreneurial family where my father, every two weeks, had to deal with making payroll, had to deal with hiring and firing. And so after working at IBM for about six months in their African-American minority program, I decided that I was going to go back home and take over the family business. Now, understand, I am roughly made about $150,000 a year in corporate America. My father's business, with his five employees, was doing an annualized revenue of about $150,000. So I moved back home to the same bunk bed I had when I was in the third grade. <laughs> All my friends had the same outcome. They laughed at me as well. Uh, but between the years of 1989 and 1996, I doubled our annualized revenue every year, going from $150,000 to ultimately $15 million, and we were the largest black-owned janitorial firm in the country. 
I sat in the back of the room one breakfast uh, in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, has a population of about 3% African American. We all knew each other. We all went to the same church on Sunday morning. I was an usher, so I had an opportunity to see everybody as they sat. I knew where, how much money they gave. <laughs> and our pastor asked those that were in the room if you were interested in being an entrepreneur or you were already an entrepreneur to stand up. Now, we had about 3,000 members at our church every Sunday, and about 2,500 of them stood. Wow. And that had the same output. Wow. As the president of the, at the time, the Phoenix Black Chamber, I said, they're on to something. Uh, I had a small business at the time, and because of my relationship with the U.S. at the time, the Greater Phoenix Black Chamber of Commerce, I said, this is it. This is what I can do, not only for myself, but for my community, but also for this country. Uh, that was the year 2000. In 2002, I had had my second firm, had grown it to about $4 million. I sold that firm July the 11th, 2000, I'm sorry, July the 9th, 2002. I'll never forget that day because two days later my wife died. Oh. Now I was forced to raise two boys by myself. They were five and six. I had no health insurance. I had no job. I had no business and I was unemployed. The chamber got me through and I committed to giving back to the chamber. Today we have 105 black chambers across the country in 19 states, and we represent 240,000 black-owned businesses. We're founded on our five pillars, and I don't think we understand the importance of the first one, which is advocacy. You see, black folks were real good in the 1980s and the 90s at set-aside programs. I'm a graduate of an 8A program, so I know how important that is. But ladies and gentlemen, those days are over. Set-asides are gone. Today it's about seats inside. And the U.S. Black Chamber is making sure that our voice is heard here in the United States in the Capitol Hill, as well as the Congress people that represent our local communities. The second one is access to capital. When I hear uh, the Urban League is doing something very similar, and that's why I wanted to acknowledge Jerry Flavin, because it's not a just about going to a bank. You see, I can't change Wells Fargo's lending policies. If your FICA store score is below 500, there's not a whole lot I can do for you. But there are things that I can do through the SBA that will allow us to have access to the capital that we all so dearly need. The third one is contract opportunities. And yes, the White House, this administration has money and they want to spend it with us. I sit in conferences on a quarterly basis and we talk about the contracts that are available where they can't find us. Now they can by having a membership and a relationship through the U.S. Black Chamber. But more importantly, not all of our members and businesses do business with the government. If we did business with each other, we'd be sustainable. The problem is when you ask African Americans what they want to do as an entrepreneur, they typically say something that I'm passionate about, something that I don't mind getting up at 2 o'clock in the morning and going and doing. And I say, wrong answer. You could be as passionate about a bad business plan as you want to be, but if it's not a product or a service that's needed in your community, you're going to fail. Let's look at opportunities from contracts that are in the future. Too often we as black-owned businesses respond to RFPs. Ladies and gentlemen, 70% of those deals are done by the time you ever receive them. We can pray over them. <laughs> we can sharpen our pencils all we want. We need to be thinking about opportunities in 2014, 2015, that we can get ahead of the curve and making sure that our students have an opportunity to succeed. Next is entrepreneurial education. I don't want to fight for you here to make sure that your advocacy voice is being heard. I don't want to fight to go get you the money. I don't want to fight to go get you the contract only so that you fail. We need to be working on our businesses as much as we work in our businesses. Again, I started off by saying more African Americans will graduate from online universities. We need to have online universities. Both Florida a and Clark Atlanta University have online universities, <laughs> pleased to say. And last, but most definitely not least, we're in the business of 
managing and developing our chambers. And in July of this year, July 24th through the 27th, we will bring 150 of the largest black-owned businesses uh, to this very same room where we will have an opportunity to present them in front of the SBA as well as this administration to make sure that when we vote, that we hold this administration accountable. We are good and we're going to go back to our communities and say, yes, we had an opportunity to come to the White House and yes, we heard a lot of great speakers, but at the end of the day, is it going to change your community? Because if not, it was a waste of your time. www.usblackchamber.org. Look us up. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Well, listen, all of our speakers made the point that success does not start and end with a good idea or even with passion about a good idea. It starts with a plan. It starts with execution. And most importantly, I think you heard again and again and again, it starts with mentoring, having those who have gone down that path before you connect with you and bring you through the process, which strengthens the bonds of the community. Not only does it make you more likely to succeed, makes you more likely to connect into those in the community who can support you at each step along the way. And I would love to talk to our panelists about mentoring that they have received and mentoring that they've done, but we are just about out of time for the panelists to speak, and I know that there's going to be some questions, so why don't we move right into that. So do we have any questions today? I know we have some microphones. <coughs> oh. Yes. I'm capable of holding. Uh, Jonathan Hollifield, it's a pleasure to be here with the America 21 Project. Couple of things, on May 21st and 22nd, we will be hosting in Cleveland, Ohio, the nation's first minority biomedical entrepreneurship conference in conjunction with BioEnterprise, Cleveland Clinic, University Hospitals, and Case Western University. Please visit minoritybiomedical.org. Secondly, Deborah, it's good to see you again. See I was a you. speaker at your first Absolutely. conference. And to build off of the points of Valerie, Terry, and Ron about meeting the puck where it's going, let's sober up a bit. 36 million black people in the United States, 1.9 million black owned businesses, 1.8 million are sole proprietors. Total revenues, total receipts from those 1.9 million businesses is about $138 billion. Essentially, 12.7% of the population is producing less than 1% of the nation's GDP. Meeting the puck where it's going, connecting to regional innovation clusters and ecosystems is critical to build off the historically great work of those on the panel and the SBA, Department of Education, and others. Marie mentioned high growth enterprise in her comments, but I would encourage us to spend some time there because we are not producing the jobs commensurate with opportunities in the nation. Thank you. I'd like to address that real quick. You know, in 2010, the census came out and everybody was excited because there were more African-American new firms for the first time, so we were excited. I was depressed because I said, here are all these African-Americans that had great jobs, middle level and supervisor jobs, and now either forced out, downsized, or just let go. So now they have become an entrepreneur and they're typically a consultant doing exactly what they were doing before. We truly need to look at where we're going into business and what we're doing when we get there. And I'd add, if we pay some attention to trends demographically, which I do in my, my job, um, the elderly is growing at a much rapid rate across the world, particularly in the United States. And so there's so many services, I just want to drop this. If you're thinking about doing something, elderly tends to have more wealth. They may not have as much income, but they certainly have more wealth. If there are services that address that unmet need, I think I'm just dropping one idea for you. Uh, Aaron, before we do that, we had one over here. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. I think the panel has done a beautiful job, and I'm happy to say I've had the honor of being at one of your events, as you know. In all of the discussions we've had today, um, I, I want to bring attention to the point of the globalization aspect of entrepreneurship. The world is getting very tiny because of online activities. And I'm one of those individuals who never got a first degree, but I run an investment fund. And I've been fortunate enough to participate in everything that this country has had to offer. I'd like to just put a comment to the panel about the HBCUs and the need to engage them in the sense that 
Africa is an emerging market, and there is a small, tiny component that I've been pushing, and that's the responsibility for people like myself from the diaspora of African parents born outside of Africa who have made a lot of money living in the United States, all because there are individuals like yourself with phenomenal educations, and the fact that some of us individuals from the diaspora owe a massive debt to people who've been to HBCUs, and we owe a massive date debt to leverage relationships to help bridge the gap between African-American businesses and the continent, an emerging market, and for a lot of people, they don't know how to get there. But if you want to leverage the relationships of people like myself from the diaspora, who've got a foot in the United States and a foot in Africa, this is one way to bring back a lot of wealth into small communities like Prince George's County. I don't think I'd be here today if it wasn't for the fact that I've been inspired by a lot of people who've done very well under very difficult circumstances. I'm not supposed to be able to run an investment fund. I don't have a first degree, but I do a pretty decent job of it. And it's all because of the inspirations of African Americans who've done phenomenally well. And that, I just want to say thank you. Hi, I'm Montez Anderson from uh, Prince George's County Economic Development Corporation. This question's for Terry Clark. Uh, we actually in Prince George's County uh, just uh, rolled out a $50 million economic development incentive fund, uh, which is unprecedented uh, throughout the country for a county. And I'm interested in hearing how your $50 million program will work. Um, as we know, many uh, companies, minority companies in particular, have problems going to your uh, banks and getting loans. And although they may have a good business plan, they can't even get a loan to expand. Um, is your fund going to be a loan fund, a grant fund, or a loan fund that can convert to grants if certain performance benchmarks are met? How exactly can that work? And we may need to talk after to see ways in which we can partner. Sounds good. Um, it'll be a loan fund with uh, a heavy emphasis on technical assistance to bring people up to speed to be able to access the fund to assist them in being able to run and operate their businesses so that the money can come back into the fund so it can be relent. Uh, we are looking to do uh, co-lending with local uh, lenders, be they other CDFIs, other community development organizations. Um, so we're, we're trying to be as flexible as possible, but also have a heavy uh, technical assistance component to bring people up to the point where they can access the fund and uh, we can certainly speak. When you go back to leveraging relationships, can I ask, um, would your fund be able to partner with a coalition of historically black colleges, for example, where you would put up a certain amount of money and they may have to raise money to meet it for the purposes of entrepreneurship? Something like that, because I, I think it's hard to replicate I mean, no need, it's not efficient to recreate the wheel. So if some schools are doing some great entrepreneurial programs, maybe other schools can join. Sometimes egos get in the way, but if you could just say this is a coalition to finance and to fund entrepreneurial efforts and that this is a cedar fund that needs to be matched, then everybody has skin in the game to making it successful. Would your fund be able to do something like that? Okay. Okay. Uh, we're going to have to wrap up here in a minute. We can. Con oh, Dr. Ogilvie, yes. Um, hello, can you hear me? I just wanted to say, um, I forgot to mention this earlier, but we're having an African Finance Summit for entrepreneur, Entrepreneurial Ventures um, this fall. So if you email me, dt at business.ruckers.edu or cued, C U E E D, at business.ruckers.edu, then we can send you some information. Thank you, Doctor. And I just want to say, we've heard the theme again and again and again today about supporting our entrepreneurs with access to capital as well as access to technical support, counseling, and mentoring. Once again, we want to convey the message today from the SBA that we are there to help your students, support them, and to help their businesses as they move into the community. Please do have them connect up with one of our district offices or one of our resource partners, SBDCs, Women's Business Centers, or a SCORE volunteer all of them will be able to navigate your small businesses and your students to each of the resources that they need at any particular time. We have a number of programs. We've been hearing about Jerry Flavin and our, uh, the ambassador for our microloan program. Uh, we have 
access to capital opportunities at each stage along the spectrum. So we encourage everyone to take advantage of that. So with that, uh, we have this conversation is uh, just starting. We're going to continue for the next couple of hours in the breakout sessions. Uh, today, we will not be reconvening back here after the breakout sessions are over because there's another event that will be starting after we leave. So once you are finished with the breakout session, that will be the end of the day for us here today. But we are going to be heading off into the breakout sessions. I do want to thank each of our panelists for sharing their really inspiring stories here today and starting this conversation about wh where we can go next. So first of all, let me say thank you to them. And if everyone could please remain seated, we're going to actually um, call up, um, we're going to call up Dr. Saunders White from the Department of Education to speak on behalf of the De Department of Education, and then we're going to hear from a senior White House official in about two or three minutes. So if everyone could just please stay seated, we'll convene the entire program in about five or ten minutes. Well, good afternoon, everyone. We've had a wonderful investment of our time this afternoon, haven't we? Absolutely. I, I just want to give another round of, of applause to this panel and the panel that preceded it because I think they have done an extraordinary job and continue to do an extraordinary job. You know, I, uh, the president talks about one government, and truly this afternoon is an extraordinary example of what that means from having the Small Business Administration and the Department of Education come together with all of you here to talk about truly how small businesses really become the economic engine that drives our economy. And so I wanted to share, if I could, a little bit about, you know, I can't represent the Department of Ed without talking about the cradle to career agenda that we have in education, starting with high quality early learning that continues with an ambitious K-12 reform agenda and concludes with a higher education agenda that improves college access, quality, and completion for all Americans. And I want to capitalize on that all Americans because the President's 2020 goal clearly says that we need to require, we need to have 8 million additional graduates over the next nine years in order for this nation to return to its proper designation of being the most educated, most competitive, most innovative organization in the entire world. Let me also share that within our MSI, and particularly our HBCU community, this administration has worked extraordinarily hard to ensure that we are doing the right thing on the access agenda. And in doing that, this administration has worked very hard to keep Pell Grants at an all-time high. So if you look at the work over the last three years, we have increased Pell by $818. And in the, if you look forward thinking in the 2013 agenda, you will see additional Pell increases. What that means, ladies and gentlemen, is that we have had 6 million students who started in our agenda, and now we're offering um, uh, Pell opportunities to 9.6 million students. Most of those students are at your institutions. Today, as we look at the opportunity, the intersection between HBCUs, minority serving institutions, and entrepreneurship, I will tell you, we will not be able to be that innovative engine if we do not ensure that as the panel say, uh, a panelist said earlier today, that we start in cre uh, creating employers instead of employees. I'm so encouraged when I heard that Bennett has a minor in entrepreneurship, Rutgers a PhD. They're nonprofit organizations within our Ana Pizzi's Mission College. We are positioning ourselves to educate the 21st century scholar. I want to 
um, conclude by really saying that um, an event like this just doesn't happen. happen. Um, Marie, your name is mentioned so many times today, but I want to uh, really afford you the accolades. My mom told me you give someone their flowers while they're here and not when they can't smell them. And so, Marie, you've done an extraordinary job leading uh, this summit, but more importantly, working with our minority-serving institutions to ensure that all of our students uh, can feel the opportunity to uh, be entrepreneurs. In my own... In my own organization, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge Dr. Leonard Haynes, Senior Director for Higher Education Programs and Institutional Services. You know, Leonard is an institution himself. <laughs> it gives me great pride to work alongside him. And you know, he is also uh, helping me to uh, understand, but he's also helping all of our young people. And with him is an Aggie himself, Jonathan Braxton. I think that <laughs> I know we've been talking about Aggie Pride a lot this afternoon. But let me just um, also say, I want to recognize and com commend all the HBCUs and MSIs represented here today. Um, it's a wonderful day to be in Washington. However, your agendas, I know, are full. And the opportunity that you've taken to come here and share your ideas, I think, has enriched this experience. We know you're doing fine jobs on your campuses. We in Washington are here to help you in any way that we can meet the objectives that you've set forth for all of our students. The Obama administration has charted a course, truly, that embraces economic recovery. Our HBCUs, our historically black colleges and universities, our MSIs, minority serving institutions, must do their part because we will, we continue to have an America that's built to last. Thank you so very much for coming out this afternoon. Well, we're about to conclude this part of the um, agenda and move quickly into breakout sessions, but I just wanted to say briefly how deeply grateful I am to all of you who have come today to participate in, as I mentioned earlier, for the SBA's part anyway, an historic conversation. And I'm uh, certainly, my name has been called a number of, t of times today, and I've, I've been humbled by that, but I have been only one part of, a, of an extraordinary team, certainly uh, Jonathan and and uh, Jonathan Braxton and, and Dr. Leonard Haynes from the Department of Education, John Brown, and my beloved colleagues at the SBA, Michael Chodos and Ellen Thrasher, Aaron Andrew, Mina Bon is here. There's so many people, Jerry Flavin, um, everyone from the SBA. Please just raise your hands and, and help me in acknowledging these people who've done so much work to get us to today. And to our extraordinary panelists, we just thank you for sharing your knowledge. So much of what gets in our way is the fact that we don't, sh we, we, ha we know everything that we need to know, and the challenge is to make sure that we're sharing it in ways that we can empower even uh, more people. Nicole Nelson, hi Nicole, I'm sorry I didn't call your name earlier. Um, to share information in a way that we, again, are providing the infrastructure for our brilliant students to truly become the business leaders, the Deborah Thomases of their generation. We have all the ingredients, but now it's up to us to connect those dots in the way that are going to truly make the difference. Um, as Dr. Saunders White mentioned, our economy depends on it. Our president talks all the time about the 21st economy that's resilient, that's robust, that's inclusive, and that's built to last. And what young entrepreneurs do, the students on your campuses are going to do uh, to make that happen is absolutely, uh, we couldn't be involved in more important work. So I hope that you have, uh, are there any other instructions, Aaron, for, for later? Yeah. We're going to have to have everyone exit out of these doors. No one can go out of these doors. We have another event coming in. But I just wanted to, we, we're going to go to the breakout sessions now. So I wanted to kind of introduce the folks. I don't know, Marie, if you want to conclude. We're going to break out number one is room 234. And Meredith is going to take this group to that. Breakout number two is room 430 BC. And breakout number three is Mina right over here. Okay. 
Okay. The number for your breakout is on your name tag. So go ahead and look on your name tag, and we just we want everyone to be have a chance to socialize. We're going to do that in the breakout sessions, but we need to move out of here within the next few minutes. So okay. thank you all very much. We will stay connected to you.